so good afternoon, everyone. And uh, my name is Mark Rothstein, and I'm the moderator of this session. Um, also a uh, speaker, if I do a decent job, because I'm last. Um, and our speakers' bios are all in the book, so you can see um, them. And I won't need to uh, say anything about them other than they're the best. And uh, um, when I was given this assignment, I only invited three people, and they all said yes. Uh, it's not like I went to my 58th choice for each one. And so um, we're going to go in the order that they're listed in the program. That We'll start with Jean McEwen, then go to Barbara Evans, and then Sharon Turry, and then me. We're going to each speak for 10 or 12 minutes, and then we can uh, open it up for discussion. And uh, uh, I will theoretically be timing you, and I'll give you a, a signal after 10 minutes is up. Okay? So thank you, and Jean will go first. And th this is on. Can you you can hear me? Okay. Um, thanks. Um, it's uh, it's been a really interesting um, morning and, and early afternoon. So um, I'm going to talk to you about um, the new or new as of a few months ago genomic data sharing policy at the NIH. Um, I'm from the National Human Genome Research Institute, and our institute was heavily involved in the creation of this policy. Although I will say I personally was not was only peripherally involved in. Um, there are actually many aspects of this that I actually find problematic, um, but nevertheless, it, it was, a, was an attempt to balance um, the interests in really encouraging broad, broad data sharing with protecting privacy to the extent that we could. Um, as most of you know, um, there's been, the um, NIH has had a real commitment to broad data sharing really ever since the Human Genome Project. That's really carried over in the years since then, and that's what this, this policy is basically um, designed to support. Um, so, just a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to go through this really quickly um, because we want to leave some time for discussion, but I'll go through just basically walking you through the process of how people, um, researchers, submit data, um, and I'm going to be talking here mostly about a database called dbGaP, which is the place where most of these data are kept, um, then how other researchers who want to use the data get access to it, get it out of the repository, um, then I'll talk a little bit about some of the implementation challenges we're having with the policy and then a few concluding thoughts. So the, the sort of um, guiding principle that we use, um, the, sort of the greatest public benefit will be realized if data from genomic studies are made available under terms and conditions consistent with the informed consent um, in a timely manner to the largest number of investigators. So it's really a lot of emphasis on the informed consent, although as we all know, um, the challenges with getting meaningful informed consent you know, obviously provide some limitation on the extent to which we can actually make sure that we're really following participants' um, intent. Um, so this policy was effective back in January, and the basic um, principle, and I think Brad Malin referred to this in his talk, is that um, we're, we really, under the new policy, are um, making it a requirement for people who are funded through the NIH um, and collecting new data or new samples um, to make the informed consent specifically state that the genomic and phenotype data can be broadly shared for future research. Um, there are exceptions available in compelling circumstances, and we can talk a little bit later about what some of those might be. This policy is still relatively new, so we haven't had a lot of opportunity to really determine what kinds of um, situations would, would constitute compelling circumstances. Um, and an important um, thing is that any limitations on the use of the data that the participants want to have in there need to be clearly stated in the consent form, and I'll come back to this uh, later. So I'm just going to go really quickly through these slides. Basically, you know, the IRB of the um, submitting, or the institution submitting the data has to make a bunch of assurances, you know, that the protocol for data collection is consistent with the law, um, that um, the plans for submitting the data into this dbGaP database are consistent with the informed consent, that they've given consideration to their, both the risk to individuals and families and also risk to groups and populations to the extent that a population might be stigmatized in some way, um, and that the plans for de-identifying the data set is consistent with the standards outlined in the policy, which I'll come back to in a second. Um, the, then the submitting institution basically takes the next step, basically, again, certifies that all the laws have been filed, followed, 
um, that the IRB has in fact reviewed the protocol in the way that I just described in the previous slide. Um, again, certifying that, the, that they will not be disclosing the identities of the research participants and again that any limitations um, placed on the use of the data have been clearly stated in the consent form. Um, the submitting investigator then um, is responsible for actually removing all the identifiers to meet the definitions for de-identified data under HIPAA and under the, um, uh, the common rule. Um, and then replacing the identifiers with a unique re random code, the code then to be held at the institution. We don't want the code uh, at the NIH. We also um, consider submitters um, or, or encourage them to consider obtaining a certificate of confidentiality. And I don't know if you are familiar with these certificates of confidentiality, but this basically is a way of um, protecting the identity of, of a research participant from uh, compelled disclosure. For example, if, if the researcher were to get a subpoena to disclose the information, they could basically cite this certificate of confidentiality as a way to, to resist um, the, um, the disclosure. But I should say the enforceability of these certificates has not really been tested and it's not really clear um, how much protection they actually um, provide. Uh, the policy does speak to the withdrawal of data um, that um, uh, in, in cases where research participants uh, decide to participate and have their data submitted to the repository but later withdraw their consent. Uh, we do allow that to happen but with the recognition that once the data have already been broadly distributed uh, there's going to be a limit to the extent to which we're going to realistically be able to retrieve that, the data that's already out there. Um, in terms of accessing the data, once the data is in there and other researchers who want to come in and apply to use it, um, here's where we get into real bureaucracy at NIH, and this is where it gets really quite cumbersome. This is kind of a, the process of, of the Ds, uh, because we have these, these different acronyms for the different kinds of certifications that have to be filed in order to get this data out of the repository. Basically, people requesting the data have to sign um, what we call a, a DUC, or a data use certification, that incorporates a code of conduct, um, which I'll come back to in a second. Uh, that in turn is incorporated into a DAR, a data access request. The DAR is reviewed by a DAC, the data access committee, and the DAC approves or disapproves the DAR taking into account any DULS, which stands for data use limitations. That is, and I'll come back to this in a second, but any specific limitations on the use of the data that the participants want to make sure get honored. Um, so, I, actually, I, I won't even really go into this just in the interest of time, but, you know, the DUC, the data use certification, basically, it's, it's a lot of boilerplate, to be honest. Basically, you know, where, where the people accessing the data are agreeing that they're not going to redistribute it, they're not going to try to identify the, um, the, the, the people who, who it came from, they're not going to try to sell the data, and that they will immediately notify the DAC, the Data Access Committee, um, if they do become aware of any kind of a security breach or any other violation of the policy. Um, there are some additional terms. I'll just skip over these. are not terribly relevant to the privacy discussion we're having here. Um, one of the things they also have to certify is that they will follow the DBGAP best practices for data security. And I've given here the, the website where these can be found. Uh, basically, there's some pretty um, detailed um, requirements regarding physical security, um, at, uh, and, and regarding uh, user training. So both of those things um, need to be in there. Um, so this is where we get into the role of the, the, the data access committees, the DACs. And really the main function of these DACs is twofold. The main one is basically to review the requests to use the data as they come in and either grant them or deny them, and then also to review the annual reports that are filed by people who, who get the data. There are, I think, the number goes back and forth, but I believe at the moment there are 16 active DACs across the NIH. A couple of institutes share the same DAC, but um, for the most part, it's sort of each institute has its own DAC. Um, and the primary question that the DACs deal with when they meet is whether or not the proposed research that, uh, you know, that research has been proposed to, be, to use the data for is consistent with, with any of these data use limitations. And um, Again, just this is when broad sharing of the data is not consistent with the informed consent. The submitters are required to state um, any limitations when they submit the data. And the main reason that the DACs will disapprove a request to use the data is when the person wants to use it for, the, for a type of study that it wasn't authorized for. For example, 
um, the consent form clearly stated that this, you know, the data could be used only for studies of, say, diabetes, and you get um, a proposed, uh, someone wants to use the data in a study for schizophrenia or something. If it's clearly not related, the DAC is not going to allow that data to be used in order to effectuate the, the intent of the um, people who, who gave the data. Um, we, uh, a couple ways that people can sort of customize or limit the way that data will be used. I mean, the most general kind of use, and this is NIH frankly required, or not required, but encourages this to the extent possible, is general research use. Basically saying, you know, loose use of the data is limited only by the terms of the um, data use certification, which is to say basically it could be used for any kind of, of research. Um, some people are not comfortable with something quite that broad, so they'll indicate something like health or medical or biomedical use. And something like that would make the data still very broadly uh, usable for most kinds of research, but would not include, for example, a study that wanted to look specifically at something like population origins or ancestry. And those kinds of studies occasionally will be th the sorts of studies that, for example, a lot of American Indians um, have objected to historically. So um, that's, it's a slightly more restrictive um, data use limitation. And then, of course, you can uh, also have disease-specific limitations that limit the data only to be used for the study of certain kinds of diseases. Or sometimes we'll see things like people don't want to have the data used commercially um, or no use outside the U.S. for whatever reasons. Um, those are the kinds of things that people sometimes specify. Um, these are extremely hard to interpret very often. I used to sit on one of these data access committees, and we would sometimes spend hours trying to figure out what some of these data use limitations meant. Here's an example of one. You know, use of the data is limited to genetic studies of schizophrenia and related conditions. What's a related condition to schizophrenia? I mean, one could argue that it could be pretty much anything under the sun. Um, in this case, we actually worked with the submitting investigator and, and went back and asked them to clarify what they thought the participants would have meant, thought that they were agreeing to when they stated, uh, you know, when they, when they signed the consent form that had that language, and we got them to clarify what they meant by related conditions. So this made it a little bit easier for the DAC to interpret um, as they were, you know, considering requests for this data set. But it still leaves a lot of um, room. Here's just another example I won't spend time on, but this is... Um, I think a real challenge with these data use limitations, they're very hard to draft with any kind of precision, and so they're hard for these data access committees to interpret. Um, all, you also have the problem that many studies, there could be, you know, multiple different consent forms used over time. Studies that continue over a long time, consent forms sometimes get revised, so, you know, it makes it administratively very burdensome to sort of administer this. Um, very inefficient, and um, I have here a picture of, of a a, a DAC meeting, and you can see it's a lot of federal bureaucrats sitting around a table trying to guess at, uh, you know, what was really intended in these consent forms that they're trying to interpret, and is this really the most, certainly not the most efficient way to do it, uh, but there's also a real question of, you know, is this sort of placing form over substance in some sense, because we're, you know, we're trying to interpret some language in a consent form that, you know, is, is se several you know, it's, it's a bit far away from sitting around in that room. Um, a couple of other challenges that we have relate to monitoring and oversight um, and, and sort of general governance challenges. Um, I won't go through this in detail, but we, you know, we do require people who access the data to submit annual reports um, listing, you know, how the data have been used and a number of other things to try to really monitor how the data is being used and to make sure that it is not being used in, in ways that are completely inconsistent with what was um, agreed to. Um, we do, um, there is a, a sanctions for misconduct. I, um, in theory, at least, failure to comply with the policy uh, could result in enforcement action, which would, could include withholding of grant funds or contract funds for, you know, if, if the, the person who requested the data and violated the policy applies for a future grant. Um, this has not yet, to my knowledge, with, with the new policy, we're not, we have not become aware of any problems with this, so we, we've not faced the question of sanctions. Um, but I think that there, um, there are realistically going to be enforcement challenges with this, primarily because, you know, we really depend on primarily self-report. Um, there are resource limitations. Uh, NIH does not have the resources to go and be, you know, sort of... Um, 
actively monitoring to make sure that absolutely no breaches are occurring. And that's, you know, it's a major issue with enforcement. And then, of course, for people who have requested the data who are not NIH investigators at all, we really have very little leverage in that, you know, they're, we're not, they're not getting funding from us anyway, so there's a limit to what we can do. So the policy, um, you know, has some problems. Um, we, we do depend to a large extent on sort of the, the good faith of the, um, the requesters. Um, a very complex governance model that I won't go into in detail, but again, sort of, this is the federal government, this is the way things get done, it's, it's, it's very clunky. Um, and just in conclusion, I mean, obviously, you know, the reason we want to encourage broad data sharing is because the more data we share, the more questions we can answer, the, you know, the better science we can do. But obviously, the more we share the data, put it out there, the less individual control um, people have who, who gave the data. And there's a concern that, obviously, to the extent that there are problems, there's a perception of risk um, and a lack of transparency um, could erode public trust and, and you know, ultimately lead to less uh, problems with recruitment and ultimately to less good science getting done. So you know, our challenge, obviously, is to try to you know, stimulate as much research as we can to really maximize the public benefit while at the same time respecting the wishes of the individual participants and sustaining that trust, which does require um, transparency. I think that's the goal um, to the extent to which it, it can be recognized, I think remains to be seen because the policy is still so new. Um, you can find, you know, really a lot of information about the details of the policy um, on this website. Um, so that's, that's all I have. Thanks. Thank you, Jane. <laughs> We're going to have the questions at the end, and as soon as she uh, loads her slides, uh, we're going to move to Barbara. I'm Barbara Evans. My main topic is the new individual access right that patients have to receive their own genomic data from clinical laboratories. But first, I wanted to just say a few words to put it in context. Sorry. When I think of regulations affecting genomics, I really think of regulations in three areas, privacy and human subject <coughs> protections, which is what we're here to talk about. But obviously, there's also a great deal of concern about consumer safety as seen in all the recent initiatives by FDA of how are we going to regulate this technology. There's another type of regulation that never gets talked about, and that's economic regulation, which we see in other sectors of the economy for how do we allocate natural <laughs> resources, how do we price pipeline transmissions, how, you know, how do we allocate rights to valuable things. I contend that one of the difficulties that leads to this ongoing intractable debate about privacy is that our major privacy regulations HIPAA and state regulations, and then also the common rule, are simultaneously trying to slip in and do the work of the economic regulations so that they are being used to allocate access to data. And obviously data are an incredibly important commodity in today's world. Uh, we used to think of just research, public health use, treatment, but it's become just so much rich richer now, and we have things like quality improvement, such as if you go to the hospital, you'd like some statistics on how many unnecessary deaths that hospital had in the past, or comparative effectiveness. Is the really expensive drug any better than the, the cheap generic? And then regulatory science, the underpinnings for decisions by entities like FDA that are trying to keep us safe. These sort of new data uses are sort of unusual because they're not what we usually think of as research. They're very rich in providing benefits to the public. You know, having those data has a, is a social benefit. It's not like commercial research. The problem we saw recently uh, is that these data resources still need to be developed to support these uses. FDA, in its recent initiatives, has noted that it... Uh, in approving genetic tests as safe and effective, it would like to rely on external databases, such as some of the data resources that Jean just talked about, 
The problem is those data resources are still not fully at the scale they need to be to support decision making by FDA. Uh, they mentioned ClinGen and ClinVar as a resource they would like to rely on to uh, determine the safety and effectiveness of genetic tests, but that data system only has 118,000 variants in it, and some of those variants that have been interpreted, and some of those, the answer was, we don't know what it means for your health. It's an unknown significance one. So we need data resources to support regulatory science, and they need to be much, much larger than they are at present. And that means developing them and building data infrastructures if we're going to do the consumer safety regulation that we would like to be doing. Uh, the problem is that, you know, and I want to say NIH has done a fantastic job creating these genetic data commons that researchers and regulators can use, but ultimately those uh, data policies to deposit apply to NIH funded researchers and then other entities can voluntarily put data in them, but uh, they don't always do it. Commercial clinical laboratories don't necessarily want to give up their data. So to get to a scale of 100 million, 200 million sample size, we need to have clinical data as well as research data going into some sort of generally accessible data commons. And there's been a lot of debate in the bioethics community in recent years that some of these uses are so valuable, do patients have an obligation now to let their data be used? And, and that's certainly a shift from the debate we were having 10, 15 years ago. And this notion that we owe it to let our data be used for these beneficial purposes. Now, there's no denying we need to use data to learn a lot of things that we don't know, such as the clinical significance of genetics, but I, I just still pause when I, I read things that say we have an obligation to let our data be used. I'd like to now turn to this example of next generation sequencing or high throughput genomic sequencing. Uh, as you may know, um, this is a technology that kind of looks at your genome and, and looks at it in large swaths of it. And typically, if you underwent whole genome sequencing, they would probably found, find that you had about three and a half million oddities in your genome, uh, where you had a variant that was different from the average or reference genome. Of those, about 10,000 variants would be in your genes, so they would be in the parts of your genome that actually have an effect on your physical condition. Uh, that's a lot of, of gene variants, and the state of our current knowledge is we only know what just a handful of them imply about your health, just a few hundreds of them that we can say, you've got a variant and it means you will be a great basketball player, or it means you'll get diabetes. Uh, for most, we still don't know what they mean, and, and to find that out, we need large data systems on scales, sometimes up to hundreds of millions of people, to infer the meaning of a rare gene variant. Now, these technologies generate massive amounts of data in getting to an answer. If your doctor ordered whole genome sequencing, they run through this these huge data files that are just terabytes of data, and then they winnow them down to hundreds of gigabytes. And finally, what I've shown in yellow here is the report that would be sent by the lab to your doctor. It would discuss two or three variants that they saw that were medically interesting for you. But in the course of getting to that final report, laboratories generate all these very data-rich files that uh, some of them they store, and laboratories use those uh, to study and to enhance the quality of the services they offer. So the laboratories have these uh, holdings, and they may share them for research purposes, but the issue that came up last year in a final rule was, why shouldn't you be able to get those data? They're about you, and, and shouldn't you have a right to request that richer set of files than what ended up in the final report in your medical record. I think this is something that the HIPAA privacy rule has done right. It's often criticized, but it provides a right for people to have access to their own health data. And it's a somewhat constrained right. It's not everything they have on file about you. It's something called a designated record set. 
that in the case of genomic data, uh, you know, opinions vary, but, but in my own looking at it, I think it includes those very rich data files that are backing up your gene sequencing report. So there's remaining concerns are we're moving into an environment where there are going to be massive amounts of health data that are not subject to the HIPAA privacy rule. If you wear a wearable fitness device, that's non-HIPAA. If you have a cardio, uh, cardiac assist device implanted and it's beaming information to your medical product manufacturer, that's not HIPAA. And you don't have that same right to get the data. And I think an important policy objective for the coming years is we need to get so that all data about you are accessible to you. How are we doing on time? you got a couple minutes. Oh, good. I've got one slide left. Broader, more broadly, though, I think this advent of getting data into the hands of the people who, you know, about whom the data are is a really important thing that can perhaps help us unblock this logjam we've had about consent versus access, this unresolved sort of tension in the HIPAA privacy rule and the common rule. Um, if people can get their own data, maybe they can, at a grassroots level, form data commons for research, and they can control the terms of those better than they've been able to do under our existing regulations. All of us, I think, have a really strong uh, sentiment in favor of informed consent, but the consent regulations we have now, like HIPAA and the Common Rule, you have a right of consent until you don't have it anymore. Uh, you, we talk a lot about consent, but at the end of the day, those same regulations say an IRB can waive your consent, or if they de-identify it, people can have your data. And so it's kind of deeply flawed uh, that we don't have that settled. As we move into this world where we have these really rich data uses that could benefit society, you know, find ways to characterize disease that would allow better treatment, better information, there's no question now that the individual decision whether or not to consent to data use is laden with um, a lot of social consequences. So we're no longer making just purely autonomous decisions. We're making decisions when we make decisions about who can use our data that affect the public good and affect society. And I wonder if maybe if data are in the hands of people, we could get to a governance model where we um, sort of make decisions in a way that is respectful of the fact that these decisions do affect others. And I analogize it to how do we decide what the speed limit is, and, and this is my last slide. We don't use a consent model for the speed limit. We don't say the speed limit only applies to you if you consent to it. We don't use an opt-in model that uh, we have no speed limit, but if you opt in, the speed limit will be 60. And we don't use an opt-out model. It's like, okay, we're saying it's 60, but if you're a really determined speeder, we're going to let you fill out some forms and opt out. We say we're making a decision, and it's going to apply to all of you. But we have some democratic process where we have some voice in uh, who chooses that. We elect them. We need a, a self-governance model of how we make decisions about what gets done with our data, where we won't necessarily be individually opting in or opting out, but we'll feel we have more voice than we have now with the current thing of IRBs making the decision for us. That's the end of my remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. And our next speaker is Sharon Terry. I'm going to go see if I can get the slides. Oh, well, thank you. Great. Thanks very much. Stand up. Um, be a little more uh, energetic than if I sit down. Uh, so thanks very much. I'll start by saying, so I'm Sharon Terry, uh, not a credentialed uh, person like these wonderful people on the panel. Uh, I have two kids with a rare genetic condition. I founded a foundation for that about 20 years ago and have for about 11 years led something called Genetic Alliance, which is an umbrella organization that um, actually uh, has about 1,200 disease organizations under it. And we do 
do a lot of different kinds of policy things. I'll also disclose that I am on the executive committee of PCORnet. You heard about PCORI at the panel earlier. Um, and so I lead PCORnet, uh, which is this $380 million project. And I'm the coordinator of all the patient-powered research networks. And this comes very nicely after uh, what Barbara has talked about. So w when we look at the problem, uh, we look at the, the fact that we need answers uh, before we release protected data. And if we call people data seekers and data holders, um, and somebody seeks access from a data holder, then basically we need to say, can this person have the information? And if this person wishes to share data, the holder uh, has to ask, do I have the right to share this data? Um, and a lot of questions. Is it permissible under federal law? What's the state law? What's my institution's law? What do I think? What does my community think? Am I Native American? And there's issues around identity, etc. And so we need fast and reliable answers to these questions um, as much as we can. So we've set up a service, essentially, that's a SaaS-based service that looks at how do we answer all of these issues uh, so that this is made simple and quick. This happens for us for in the banking industry. It happens for us in lots of other industries. And so we're applying some of the same things here. Um, we set up essentially something called an independent consumer privacy bureau with a company called Private Access that has a privacy layer. And this allows the kinds of uh, questions to be asked and answered that I just showed. Um, it also gives us an idea if something is yes, no, or unclear. Um, and sometimes it's unclear, as Jean was talking about, and gives the participant the opportunity to consent or decline to share information. And I'll show uh, an application of this. Um, there's also an audit trail of everything, and there's also a, a brokerage of some fee. We have not instituted any fees yet because we're still uh, transparently playing with this system to see if it works. We have about 30 communities on it so far. We looked at the fact that we often try to use an on-off switch, and we also often try to rely on consent, and consent, I think, is pretty broken for managing all of this. We really try to use this transaction of 90 pages or 30 pages or whatever it is and try to use words that make sense um, when they can't be as contextual or dynamic and granular as they need to be. And then you can see in this curve uh, that Alan Weston put together in 2009 for the IOM that there's lots of different sensibilities around whether or not to share. There's a lot of solutions. And what we've decided is that you actually need to take care of all these kinds of sensibilities or perspectives, and you need to put them in the pocket of people who could or want to share data. Uh, we put together um, this uh, platform called Platform for Engaging Everyone Responsibly. We call it PEER for short. Uh, we have about 8,000 people or so on it. About 90% of individuals on it say they trust it, and that's because we keep it community-based. It's always not done kind of globally, but done in the community with guides from the community. You can see four or five of the websites here um, and the uh, sensibility of the individuals. So the architecture looks like this, and it's moderately complicated, um, but, it, but it works. So this central part is essentially the database that lots of us are used to looking at for um, these kinds of systems. Uh, health data, we keep the contact information in here, and that's odd for a lot of people. A lot of people strip out the contact information and make this de-identified. We claim that then you're not going to get longitudinal data, you're not going to get the kind of genotype-phenotype correlations, you're not going to get kind of the living system that we need in a learning healthcare system whether it's curated survey data, genomic data, or EHR data. We also have a privacy directives database that adjudicates what information goes to this permitted information database, which is virtual and constantly uh, essentially refreshed. We have a consumer portal to enter that information in, and we have a researcher portal to Google that information, essentially, and then for the researcher to get what they're permitted to get. And I'll show you how that looks. So essentially, we start in this environment of trust. And what you're looking at here is um, a Joubert syndrome and related diseases foundation. Now, some of these are foundations that are related to diseases. Those are the easy places to start because these people are very uh, you know, want, willing to do this. I have two kids with a genetic disease. They're going to be blind when they're 30. I'm going to really work hard to give their information. And they are now because they're adults uh, in ways that are meaningful. We've begun to do this with other kinds of communities, nurse midwives and the 10% of births in the United States that are in hospitals by a nurse midwife. Those are normal pregnancies for the most part, normal people for the most part. Uh, we're looking at uh, Native American First Nations, LGBT communities, so we're starting to branch out from the disease communities, but these were early adopters and very easy to, to uh, work with. So we essentially take their website, insert a iframe into it so that it looks like them and feels like them. They've created it, so it's theirs. 
Uh, then we give them a preferences dashboard where they can put their contact information, their privacy directives. We then give them a dashboard to allow them to upload medical history, health surveys, medical records. We are not EHR connected yet. That's a, a, a process we're going through right now uh, to figure out how to do that uh, afford with an affordability uh, issue. Um, data capture so that there's a data holder. Again, this doesn't have to be centralized. It can be uh, anywhere, any place. This data can live. The privacy directives are the thing that make a decision about where it goes. And then here comes our data seekers. They ask the privacy directives, may I have this information, allow, deny, or ask me. Um, so we have not just yes, no, we also have maybe, and I'll show you a little more about that in a second. And the same thing with contact information. Maybe now I want to do a clinical trial with these people or I want more information from these people, and so I'm able to ask if they've allowed me to contact them. 85% of individuals so far have said allow for most things. 10% have said ask me. 5% have said deny. Again, we think that's highly skewed for the normal population, so to speak. But again, we think if we do this in communities, daycare centers, churches, temples, then we're going to get a lot more interactivity and, and, uh, and, and trust in those communities. So guides uh, help the participants decide upon permissions. And what you're looking at here are guides from the um, Coalition for Pulmonary Fibrosis, a project we did with the FDA for their patient-focused drug development work to get preferences from these individuals around risk and benefit. And you see the guides have set preferences. You see these little dots again underneath their pictures. And if you click them, that curve comes up that I showed you before. You can see someone like this guy, George Lapidus, who apparently is a famous uh, um, sports reporter in Atlanta, is completely open, green totally open. You can see other people are more conservative about their information. They're making a recommendation about a dashboard, and the dashboard um, essentially gives you, the individual, some, some guidance about what to expect. There's an audit log. You can make this for any member of your family. Dynamic consents may be set from the, the phone. So this is the dashboard, and we can make these very simple for a community with only two or three options on them, or we can make them fairly complicated. This is Joubert's, and they wanted Joubert. They wanted organizations serving the conditions. They wanted all organizations, researchers, different kinds, all the way to all researchers. And then data analysis platforms, things like PCORnet, could be dbGaP. Uh, ClinVar is on one of our Free the Data programs. And then there's three classes of information. Can you discover me? Just de-identified information. We're actually asking people if they want to consent to share that information. The reason for that is we've seen things like data.gov in the, in the UK um, collapse because people's legally shared information, de-identified, was shared and people got upset. Just like if I go to your house and take your bicycle right now, you're going to get upset. But if I ask you, you probably will lend it to me. So we're, we're, we're having that um, asking there. Um, export and use. Can you export or link to my data? And then contact me. May, me. may you contact me? And you can customize these. You can change them quite easily. You can ex just accept what the guides have shared with you. We also want to put this in the individual's pocket. So here is a, a request from a researcher, so a research opportunity. Do you want to get involved in this research? The links here go to things like clinicaltrials.gov, go to other places that are reliable, go to maybe the profile of the individual at their institution, and you can consent, decline, or snooze, um, allowing you to, to uh, participate in the research. Um, the the um, disease advocacy organization, in this case, I think it's Pancreatic Cancer Action Network, sets up who they want on this dashboard for you to consent to or be part of. Um, I'm working on this. I'm working with Robert Shelton to give credit where credit is due. A lot of the technology, 400,000 lines of code uh, are his. We're also working with Dixie Baker, who uh, is the chief technology officer, has a lot of experience having worked a long time in both federal government as well as other uh, areas. And then a chief privacy officer of the United States, who is no longer the privacy officer, is working with us. Um, and until um, but we uh, kind of get a little further along, she's asked for me to redact that. Um, privacy. Uh, so there's our contact information in case uh, you'd like any more information. Thank you. So our final speaker um, needs no introduction and will get no introduction. Um, I'm going to talk for just a few minutes so we have uh, time to um, still have some questions. And I want to take up the issue of international research 
And here's the framework or the setting in which this arises. As you all know, um, to do some of the more sophisticated genomic-based research, you need large data sets. And when they run into hundreds of thousands or even millions of uh, samples and records, increasingly you're going to have to use international sources, especially for rare diseases. Can you get that information? Can you send information? Can you receive samples from overseas? And that answer is a maybe at the moment. And that's what we are researching, the maybes and the whys, and how can we do two things simultaneously. One, uh, encourage sharing and encourage international research at the same time that you're still protecting privacy. And uh, a lot of the problem is translating one law into another. So with the generous support of the NIH, I want to um, describe our just skip over lots of stuff. Sorry. Oh. This will make it easier. I loaded the wrong show. OK, so <laughs> uh, here's what uh, we attempted to do. There are all these um, countries that have different privacy laws. And nobody seems to know what they are, what they mean, and how they relate to us. So we selected about two dozen of the countries that have done the most research or are mostly engaged in setting up biobanks and sharing information. And we're trying to find out what the laws are in those countries related to health privacy. So we identified a leading expert on health privacy laws and biobank laws and research laws in these countries. And uh, they're, they're collaborating with us. And I should say my co-investigator is Bartha Knoppers from McGill University in uh, Montreal. And we are having these people uh, write summaries of their legal system and their biobank system and so forth according to a standard template so we can compare them. And once we get them all in, we're going to have all these tables and, and you, you'll be able to compare them. Um, and then our goal is to try to take a look at these and figure out ways of harmonizing the laws. Now, um, it's rather grandiose uh, to imagine that 25 countries are going to change their laws just because Mark and Bartha say it's a good idea to do that. Um, but even assuming that doesn't take place, there's two very good things that are still going to come out of our research. Number one, uh, we're going to have a compendium of all these laws that don't exist anywhere now. So you're a researcher and you want to send something to Spain, can you do that? Or can you get samples from you know, South Africa? You're going to find out if you can do that. Second, many of the research collaborations uh, are private groups that have um, been set up, like the um, the uh, IHEC, the International Human Epigenome Consortium, the ICGC, the International Cancer Genome Consortium, the Global Alliance, and so forth. Um, we think that we're going to have valuable things to contribute to them that they may be able to include in the contracts um, that or the agreements that are signed with these people. Can you hold it? For, I'm, I'm, I got it. Um, and so, so we're putting all this stuff together, and it's going to be published in uh, uh, two special symposium issues of the Journal of Law, Medicine, and Ethics. The first issue is going to be out in January of 2016. And so um, you can look for, for our research to be uh, published then. So we have a few minutes for questions, and um, maybe uh, it, the easiest thing to do would be if you just stay where you are, and maybe I can get a microphone to you to answer questions. Uh, I, I am neither a patient nor a researcher. I don't get funded by research funds, and I don't have a 
I am a privacy policy technology uh, professional, as you would say. And I feel so completely disconnected from the conversation here, other than Barbara Evans' perspective, which I understand perfectly. And I don't know where even to begin, but let me just pose a very simple question from my perspective okay. as an engineer in this. If the patient, the patient visits a physician, typically, the physician is part of an institution subject to some employment and other institutional agreements. There is data created, uh, very high dimensional data, as Barbara has determined. Some of it is useful for clinical, some of it is useful for research. At that point, the system bifurcates. You have the system that we just heard 50 minutes of explanation about how to manage consent and how to manage data flows and access in the research space, and then we have some of the rest of the conference for the most part, except for the previous panel, that talks about the clinical side of this. And nowhere do the people involved in the research side lay out the interaction from the patient perspective or from the perspective of somebody like me who's trying to develop technology to develop both. And it's just incredibly frustrating. I'm sorry to sort of lay it on you, but uh, I don't know. My question is, where do we have this discussion? With NIH, I'm glad you're here with Duke Genetic Alliance. You are the right people to have this discussion with, with Barbara Evans, and I don't know where we're supposed to have it. Yeah, so I think we have to have it together, and our system is not research or clinical. It's both, because we don't think that those two things should be bifurcated. We think we should be using clinical data to be used in research regularly, and also research data to go right back into the clinic. So the observational stuff that Bakori described, for example, is a, a virtuous cycle, I hope, um, and allows that interaction. And so in our system, for example, the patient goes to the doctor, and the doctor enters some of the data into those screens. The patient enters their perspective and their information into the screens. The, the care provider might, a proxy might, and all of that information then is available to the researcher. You didn't hear my question. Oh, I didn't say it clearly. Where does the, what NIST calls the privacy engineering get done? So we have 400,000 lines of code that build that privacy database. But the, clinicians, the, clinical, the clinical side is not involved. So I'm, I tried to describe this idea that from the patient perspective, at yes. some point it bifurcates, and the privacy engineering isn't being done upstream where the doctor and patient are, or relative to a data yeah. balance yeah. where there is no distinction between them. Yeah. The privacy engineering by this community is being done Elsewhere. Right. So for us, for Genetic Alliance, we did look at trying to go to the clinics and hospitals in the United States, and we were banging our head against a very big wall. So what we did instead is said that every individual is not a HIPAA-covered entity and has the right to do what they want with their data, particularly with the recent um, rulings, and that if that individual says, my EHR, my medical data, my laboratory reports, my genome are going to be deposited here, and I'm going to decide how it will be used, then we will aggregate that data more quickly and use it more quickly. And we are partners in this. We would like, on the, those of us that are trying to, would love to have that happen, just as Sandy Pentland said in his keynote. Yep. How do we do this? How do we both stop banging our heads together? Right. So it, it, as my, in my job with PCORnet, what we've done is have AHIP in, we've had the various medical centers in, we've had the EHR vendors in, and we have talked about how can we start to get this data more fluid, more liquid, more useful overall. And the conversations are very, very difficult. The culture's incentives are all bent out of shape and not going in the right directions. Um, we're hoping things like Argonaut, for example, will help, will help us because we may have interoperability solved. Um, yeah, so, uh, and I could tell you disagree with me, and I'm not an expert on any of this, so I'm going to stop talking. Yeah. And the, only, the one thing I would add is, is that, uh, you've heard of this, the Precision Medicine Initiative coming up. Um, I know that there will be opportunities for a lot of input on a lot of these things. Um, that's going to be, I mean, I think, you know, something that may potentially create models for the future. Um, so stay tuned, I think, over the next six months. Um, 
So we've got time for one uh, more quick question. Yes. I have a question of how we deal with the changes in cognitive um, ability over time when you're going back. You know, do you assess it initially or in instances, even if you do assess it initially, um, how do you account for that if you go back to someone, say, two years later, five years later, and their competency may have changed? Right. So we are working with an Alzheimer's community. Um, that community helps to decide that. And so, for example, we've worked in things that when you can no longer answer these three things, then it reverts or converts to your proxy or caregiver. Because that's really critical um, information, especially, you know, matched with research um, apps on the iPhone that do decide whether your cognition is still good. And then the same thing with children. So when you turn 18, the account gets turned over to you, um, and you no longer have to live by the privacy settings that your parents set. And really, lots of parents are using assent stuff that we've built in and doing that more around 10, 11, 12 years old. Okay. okay. Just a quick question. Um, uh, uh, does administrative um, data play any role here? Do you have access to deal with that? So in our system, we would like to, um, and we are working on that with Corey to see how much of that can be used and can we do it in a way that's respectful to communities? Because again, if we just use it. I'm just not sure with, when you say our system, I'm trying to figure out which hat you're talking about. So in this case, peer. Peer. But then okay. in the Macquarie system, so okay. separate hat, um, we are talking to the payers, et cetera, hospitals around uh, about administrative data, other data that is normally used for quality assurance, uh, trying to figure out what of that can be used respectfully, respectful of the individual patients. So I want to thank you all for coming. Um, thank my friends. Uh, Sorry it had to be uh, so uh, short, but uh, we'll be around for the next year or so, and I want to make a special invitation to come tonight to the award ceremony.